Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing SOS's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. SOS is a cryptocurrency miner marketing and commodity trading company. It has mined 132 Bitcoin and 1853 Ethereums all in the first half of 2021. Since April of this year, it started trading commodities, and that was 84% of its revenue in the first half of 2021. It trades mineral resin, soybean, wheat, sesame, liquid sulfur, and latex. It identifies buyers and sellers and generates revenue from the price difference. Revenue is recognized after products have been delivered and title to the goods and risk has been transferred from seller to buyer. It sounds like arbitrage, which is simultaneously buying and selling securities to take advantage of differing prices for the same asset. It also generates a good amount of revenue from its insurance business. A small amount of its revenue is from its telecom call center, bank call center, and SaaS platform. SaaS stands for Software as a Service. My head was spinning just trying to figure out what this company does because it seems like they have their toe dipped in everything. The company is headquartered in Qingdao, China, and was founded in 2015. It went public in 2020 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 454 million market cap. They're trading at 243 a share, and they have 187 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video and free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they do have negative free cash flow every year. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's positive in 2020, negative in the other years. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that tripled from 2018 to the trailing 12 months. It quadrupled from 2020 to the trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales, Less than 1% of their revenue is from these three areas, the telecom call center, bank call center, and SaaS. Insurance is 7% of its revenue, that's 13 million. Crypto mining is 8%, that's 15 million. But their biggest revenue, which they just started in April, and these financials are as of June 30th. So they've been only operating in this part of the business for two or three months. They generated 155 million of revenue, that's 84% of their revenue. I'm not sure of the margins of this business because you don't get much information in their financials. But with so much revenue coming in, this could be their main focus going forward. Because I don't think the margins from cryptocurrency are too high because they have to spend a lot of money for the machinery and electricity. I would imagine insurance marketing has pretty good margins. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and their gross profit was lower in the trailing 12 months when compared to 2018 and 19, even though they had much higher revenue. So I guess the margins on commodity trading aren't that good. But maybe it just takes time for economies of scale to set in and build out efficiencies. Below that is their operating expenses, and most of their operating expenses are SG&A. This is the rent for its headquarters, payroll, and marketing. So they do have negative operating income every year except in 2020. They don't have much debt on their balance sheet, so they don't really have interest payments on their debt. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was negative every year except 2020. This is the company's statement of cash flow. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses from its operational business. So you could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They do lose a lot of cash flow each year, a ton in the trailing 12 months. And their CapEx was the highest in the trailing 12 months of $35 million. And I think this is mainly due to the investment in the cryptocurrency rigs and computers. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And of course, that's negative each year. And they don't really use debt to run their business. It's mainly capital stock. And they issued nearly $600 million of capital stock in the trailing 12 months. When a company issues so much stock, it dilutes the current shareholders, making your shares less valuable. But this can be a good thing because if the return on the investment from the $600 million is more than the amount they diluted your shares, then it's a positive thing. They're adding value to the company. But if the return on investment from the $600 million is less than the dilution, that's a bad thing. I was able to find their statement of cash flows in one of their reports. And the top part of the statement of cash flows is cash flow from operations. And the way you calculate that, you start with your net income 
and this is for the first half of 2021. So they had a $20 million loss. Then you have to add back the non-cash items on the income statement. So we add back 5.5 million of depreciation, 18 million of stock-based compensation. It looks like they invested over $100 million into inventory. There's not much detail in these reports, so I'm not sure what that inventory relates to. It's probably computers or something related to their crypto mining. But the real concerning thing is they booked $196 million of receivables. The reason that's concerning is because they only had revenue of $184 million. This indicates they received no cash from the revenue they booked and extended an additional $12 million of credit. I don't understand how you could book more in accounts receivables than your revenue for that time period. I know there's a delay when the company gets the revenue from commodity trading. They have to wait for the commodity to get delivered to the buyer from the seller. Once that happens, they get their revenue. So if their receivables were around $150 million, it might be okay. It's just so odd that it's more than their revenue. Even though they reported a $20 million loss on the income statement, they actually lost $339 million of cash. The hope is in the next reporting period, in the second half of 2021, a lot of this cash will come in and they'll have a big cash inflow. And you can see in the first half of 2021, they raised $551 million from issuing stock. This is the equity section of the balance sheet. They have $560 million of equity. They received $577 million from selling their business. And they lost $15 million from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. $560 million of equity, $4 million of debt. So they're 99% equity, 1% debt. And their weighted average cost of capital is 9.92%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $1.6 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today's new weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $839 million. We divide that by 187 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 448. They're trading at 243. So they're trading at a 46% discount. It's a buy according to the model. It's really hard to value this company because there's no analyst projections and there's limited financial information. It is hard to figure out which direction they're going. The fact that they grew their revenue so much, more than four times from 2020 and three times from 2018, I grew their revenue 50% for the next four years. And then I grew 2.5% after that. And I gave them negative free cash flow in 21, 22, and 23 because it looks like that's what's going to happen. And I assumed they'd have 114 million of free cash flow in 2024. The average company converts 10% of their revenue to free cash flow. Of course, this is an estimate. I'm still a little weary about their financials. It doesn't seem like I have all the information. So obviously, it's a pretty big guess. The only price target I found was on the Wall Street Journal. Their price target was $20 for this stock. This is where the stock has been trading since 2017. It looks like it was over $100 a share, but it couldn't have been that high. They must have done a reverse stock split, but I can't find information on them doing a reverse stock split anywhere. So if that is correct, the stock has gone down a ton, down to 243. Here's a candlestick chart since 2021. So the stock was trading over $15 at one point. A lot of people were excited about this stock. A lot of news stories, a lot of things on Reddit and Wall Street bets. So the stock was driven up, mainly due to cryptocurrency craze. But I think what really hurt the stock was all the short sellers, especially Hindenburg. They put out a report really bashing the company, speculating if it was a real company, saying their headquarters was not even a real place. It was just a hotel that they weren't located in. The company has refuted these claims. But as you know, perception is more important than reality. And the stock is up the past 52 weeks, more than S&P 500. The low was 121, the high was 16. And it is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. This is a really popular stock. 8 to 12 million shares are traded each day. Of the 187 million shares outstanding, 46 million are on float. 7% are held by institutions. And even though the stock price is pretty low, it has a high short percentage. Nearly 12% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company in 2017, you'd be down to $3,700 today. That's a 63% loss. The biggest shareholders, Intercoastal, at 2%. Then BlackRock, the CEO of the company, owns 0.6% of the stock, and Morgan Stanley. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. They do have a really good price-to-sales ratio. Their market cap has come down a lot. And their revenue has come up so much. So it's 2.0. Investors are paying $2 for $1 revenue. And they also have a good price to book of 0.8. That recent capital raise really bolstered their balance sheet. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 46% discount. 
and this stock has come down so much, it could be a good value. A big concern is that Chinese stocks have really struggled this year with governmental interference. I think they'll come back up, but it might take a while, and a lot of people have a hard time waiting. It seems like the company is really trying to grow its revenue by going into different types of markets. My big concern is they didn't receive any cash for all the revenue they booked, and they booked a lot of revenue in the first half of 2021. But maybe this is a timing thing, and in the second half of 2021, when we look at their financials, maybe there'll be more color on the situation. I ranked their free cash flows 1 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratio is 4 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.